Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, um, thank you very much. Um, you're aware that this that this session is being recorded. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, can I, on behalf of the committee, we have we have a number of, uh, of the Foreign Affairs Committee here. We're really grateful. It's a pretty early start for us, but um, um, it's getting a bit later in the day for you. Anyway, we're very grateful for you coming along. So thank you very much. Not, not at all. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Now then. Um, the Hong Kong Journalist Association called 2014 the darkest year for press freedom for several decades. Do you agree with that? I think the signs of late, um, not just this year, but building up to this year in the last couple of years, have been um, pretty dismal on, on a lot of fronts. Um, we have seen at one extreme outright violence and intimidation of members of the press. Um, one notorious case, which I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, is was um, re regarding um, the former editor of Ming Pao newspaper, um, Kevin Lau, who was who is still recovering um, some nine months on after suffering a pretty savage beating. Um, there have been smaller scale, but no less um, worrying uh, incidents um, of, of similar physical um, violence. Now. The, the, the theme in those attacks is, is, is that no one um, or, or some people in, in the Lao incident have been um, are being prosecuted, but there's never any clear indication as to what caused this um, attack. And um, but, you know, you don't have to be able to draw the, all the dots together to, to see a, a climate developing whereby people who are in the media, um, who are outspoken on certain issues, notably um, to do with um, uh, the influence of China, for instance, in, in various fora, are, are singled out. Their publications are singled out. Another one um, that has been much uh, <clears throat> in the news of late is, is, is the uh, Apple Daily Group, um, which um, we've seen attacks on its print works, for example, and, um, and, and like cases. Now, um, on a lesser scale, but perhaps more insidious, is, is um, censorship or, or self-censorship, where you see um, individual journalists, newsrooms collectively, and editors second-guessing themselves. We hear this um, over and over again. Um, it's hard to pinpoint, of course, that's the very nature of self-censorship, is, 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 is trying to determine to what extent people are, are, are biting their tongues, as it were, and, 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 and restricting themselves in what they write. But Anecdotally, and, and from talking to people we uh, know and, and from our colleagues in the Hong Kong Journalists Association, um, that climate of self-censorship is, is there and it's real. Um, and, and there's outright um, dictates um, being issued. We saw one um, incident of late uh, arising from the Occupy Central protest movement where the TV station TVB, their, their newsroom, their journalists were up in arms and circulated a petition at what they saw as management's uh, imposition or, 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 or um, uh, heavy-handed uh, editing of material coming out of the protest, which they thought, which the journalists thought um, was designed to um, um, uh, lessen the, the impact of, of um, some excesses by police um, on, on the protest lines, specifically concerning journalists. And in that protest movement of late, we've seen journalists being uh, we feel targeted for arrest and uh, and intimidation uh, as they go about their reporting. So um, it adds up to a, a worrying picture and um, more worrying, I would say, than at any time since um, since the handover. Certainly, that's not to say that these issues are new. The, 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 these these problems have always been there and and, and existed under British rule, um, but. Um, when you bring in the fear, the very real fear that um, China is watching and, um, um, and that people are having to restrict what they say or, or, or suffer the consequences, then, then yes, it does add up to a pretty dismal picture. Thank you. Uh, first, I presume that Mr. Mor Francis Moriarty has now joined you. He's just here now, yes. Uh, yes, I'm here. I don't know whether you can see me. I can. Yes, you can. Thank you. And we can hear you. Yeah. 
Um, Mr. Jo uh, Joshi, following off of what you just said, where is this coming from? Is, is it coming from the Hong Kong authorities or from the Chinese authorities? I, I think that's that that's hard to say, and, and in many cases, it's not coming from any authority at all. It's coming from uh, commercial interests. Um, you bear in mind that, um, with the exception of, of Jimmy Lai and, and the and the Apple Daily Group, um, most uh, of the mainstream media publishing and, and TV in Hong Kong are owned by business groups, tycoons, with who are who are very heavily invested in mainland China. Now, um, it, it, it doesn't take um, you know too much um, insight to figure out that they don't necessarily want the boat rocked when it comes to their media outlets reporting stuff that might reflect badly on them um, and their business interests in China. And uh, do, do you, I mean, how does it? You, you mentioned briefly a moment ago that this went on under the British rule. Do you think there is a trajectory here? Is it getting worse? How does it compare with, say, ten years ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned the pre-handover situation just to just to say that you know this is not entirely new. That that there were there were instances in the in in the past where people felt the, the heavy hand of authority and. and um, and were warned off, or, but nothing. I don't think we've, we've seen anything as, as heavy-handed as, as we've seen of late. Um, and the trajectory is um, certainly, in my recollection, I, I don't recall it being this bad, and, and it's certainly got a lot worse over the last year or two. Um. The, as, as you know, famously, we're banned, and I'm, I'm only too sorry that we're not sitting there with you um, um, doing this across the table. Do you think it's in the same category? Is it the, is it the same sort of thinking that's uh, banning us and, and leading you to say it's as bad as it ever has been? I think your experience on the visa front is, um, is, is, is uh, um, un unfortunate for you, but actually... Um, brings to light something that journalists in China and Hong Kong have been long experiencing, which is that, um, and we've seen it over the last couple of years um, among several Western media outlets who um, are trying to get visas to um, send staff into Beijing or Shanghai, or have staff in those places who have seen their visas suddenly withdrawn, or um, in one case, um, a, a journalist with the New York Times who, who was outright kicked out. It doesn't tend to be that overt. What you tend to see is that um, under the Chinese system, all the, all the journalist visas are, are renewed on, on, on mass at the end of the year, and we're coming up to that now. And um, no reason will ever be given if your visa renewal is denied uh, at short notice and suddenly you find yourself homeless and having to retreat to Hong Kong or somewhere else, wherever your employer might be willing to uh, let you let you go into exile. We have one uh, quite, quite a growing group of journalists here who, who technically are employed in China now, but are unable to get in there. And what that does in terms of the impact on a free press is, again, people are looking over their shoulders, you know. If, if it's inevitable that if you feel you write the wrong thing, your <coughs> entire um, existence in a, in a place is then going to be affected, you might pull your punches. I, I can't say that that happens for, for sure, but um, anecdotally from talking to colleagues, you know, there, there is a sense in which people worry, you know, uh, um, is my visa going to be renewed? And, and, and we've seen that you know, in, in, several, in several cases now. Thank you. Mike Gates. Can you clarify, um, you refer to visas. Uh, British citizens don't need visas to come to Hong Kong. Uh, no. Uh, does that, do, but do people coming to work from uh, other countries uh, who want to come to Hong Kong to work as journalists, do you need official accreditation in order to, to work as a journalist in Hong Kong? You don't, there is no system of official accreditation in Hong Kong. Some countries, some, some um, nationalities uh, require visas to enter Hong Kong. Um, British, Americans, most um, European Union and, 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 and most countries in Asia, you don't actually need a visa to visit Hong Kong. You will need a, a visa to work here, though, uh, if you stay beyond a certain period of time. Can, can I add something Francis, to that? Francis, do you want to add? Um, if I may, um, the issue of, it's not a direct visa issue, but the question uh, within your question is what identifies a person to be a journalist? 
In Hong Kong, we have no central accreditation of journalists, which sets us apart in another way from China, where if you want to work as a journalist, uh, whether you're domestic or foreign, you are going to have to register with the All China Federation of Journalists, uh, which is, of course, a government party organization. In Hong Kong, we don't have that, and we've not wanted it. Uh, the issue is not coming in here for us uh, so far, although there have been cases of people who have been banned. For example, the artist uh, who did the statue that's brought out every year for the June 4th uh, memorial, uh, he's Dutch. Uh, he's not been allowed into Hong Kong for a few years. But uh, it's, it's not so much coming in as once you get here and you want to work, um, showing yourself as a journalist, if, especially if you're a freelancer. If you come from, you know, The Guardian or, or uh, Deutsche Welle or whatever, you're going to have a letter from your employer that says, here you are, here's what you do, you'll, you'll, you'll get accreditation. If you're a freelancer, and, and today with the internet and the whole changing media scene, that is a very real live issue, um, it, it gets more difficult. So in, in a way, while we've been focusing on traditional media organizations, that's to say those that have radio stations or TV stations or print on paper, the, the future now is is people who do websites and, and collect news on websites and and how are they journalists and what's a citizen journalist and, 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 and what have you. So when the police began asking people during Occupy Central to show their press ID, they were determining for themselves what they would accept as acceptable press ID and what they wouldn't. And you can work your way back from this to see what our basic concern is, who accredits journalists. In the past, we never had to worry about that. You know, you said you were a journalist, you had a business card that said journalism, and you went and you, and you did your work, and people dealt with you. Uh, but now we can see that the, the, we can see the forces of order here uh, laying the groundwork. Uh, for example, when they cracked down on the final day of Occupy Central, uh, and they, they gave us a warning and said, if you don't leave at this point through the approved entrance after this, you can only go out one exit and you will have to show your ID for recording purposes whatever that means. So if you went out and you had press ID that they accepted as press ID, you just passed through. If you didn't, then I guess you're suspected to have been one of the participants, but they would record your name and your ID card and information. And this put freelancers in a very difficult situation because many news organizations will, will use a freelancer's work, even use it extensively, but not provide them with a letter that says, um, here's the situation, uh, this person works for us, uh, please afford them the usual courtesies of the press. Uh, they won't give them that because they're concerned, for example, about liability. And so you have journalists who are now caught in a very difficult situation, and one can foresee that, that, that the government might say at some point, gee, wouldn't it be convenient if we had some organization that provide people with accreditation and we could all agree that that was good accreditation? Wouldn't that be an improvement? Well, it wouldn't be. Sorry, an like, we, could see it. Like, we could see it coming. I do apologize for interrupting you. Unfortunately, time is quite limited on this link at the moment. I'm sorry to go that long, but I, want you to, I just yeah. want to point out that the squeeze comes from many directions. It's not always so overt. Uh, that's great. Uh, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Sandra. Good morning. Um, or good afternoon, I should say, in your case. Um, the Hong Kong Journalists Association has also noted that the right to freedom of speech in the press is still protected by law in Hong Kong. Do you think the law has been sufficiently enforced? And if not, why not? Um, is, that, that, that comes back to the issue of intimidation, for instance. You know, if, if people are attacked um, because they've um, written um, or reported things that find disfavour, um, and if they're not, if, if um, people aren't prosecuted, um, speedily, or, or if the evidence is there, or people are seen to be dragging their feet, then that would appear then that the you know that that fundamental freedom is not being protected. But as I say, it's just, it's a hazy situation because no one ever comes out and says, "Yeah, I I I, I attacked uh, I attacked so and so because I don't like what he wrote." Um, it's 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 a, it's it's a, it's an insidious situation, but the climate is clear that um, um, there is intimidation out there. The question would be, in that, to answer your specific point, has the government, has the SAR government, been sufficiently outspoken in in defending those rights? Um, I would say not. You know, not not when it comes to recent events, when when 
Um, we've seen cases of journalists, photographers being apparently singled out for, for rough treatment or, or arrest. Yeah. You've already talked about self-censorship vis-à-vis the owners of the press, etc. Um, has, has the pattern of ownership uh, changed? Is it new people? I'm sorry. Has the pattern, has the of, pattern of Yeah. Uh, is it new people who are coming in and buying up? Yeah, I mean, if you look it, to to an extent, the the the, the same business groups uh, are, as, uh, are as heavily involved as ever in in a lot of those titles. Um, if you look at, but there have there have been changes. But what changes there heart there have been have have generally involved switching ownership from one set of uh, owners who are heavily invested in China to another set um, in a, in a similar situation. So. The overall editorial direction may not change, or and you know I should stress I suppose that um, proprietors, media proprietors the world over, and you know this very well in the UK, um, have have commercial interests and 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 sometimes seek to impose that that, that those interests that line on their editorial um, um, titles. So um, it's not a situation that's unique to Hong Kong, but. Um, you know, one of the things that makes Hong Kong, and, and, and I suppose this is a point that's very relevant to your deliberations, one of the things that makes Hong Kong so different, so so advantageous for a lot of people, and, and including the media, is that it's a part of China and yet set apart from China. Um, we, you know, we, there are basic freedoms enshrined in the law here, um, it, freedoms that are just not found on in, in anywhere in the mainland. And, and, and therefore, Hong Kong is... is um, a uniquely advantageous va- uh, vantage point to observe and report on China. Um, those freedoms, it feels to many of us, are, are being slowly eroded. Uh, if I could add one point to your question. In the past, you would have had owners, owners who had financial interests in China. But increasingly, we see ownership patterns where mainland interests are directly investors mm. in the media. Okay, that's precisely what I was going to ask you about, so thank you. Thank you, John Burke. Uh, good afternoon to you. Um, the committee is also looking at whether the UK government has been robust enough in its response to how what is perceived to be the Chinese authorities have cracked down on, on the democratic uh, movement and so forth. Um, as part of that, um, we noticed the six-monthly report the last one, where the FCO, uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, stated that freedom of the press is, and I quote, one of the fundamental freedoms protected by the Joint Declaration, unquote. It then went on and added, and the FCO takes seriously concerns about press freedom and welcomes the Chief Executive's clear statements on press freedom. Do you think these statements go far enough? I'm, I'm not sure what the clear statements from the Chief Executive are um, if if the FCO can point us to those that would be helpful. I mean, you know, the the, the SAR government has has condemned. To be fair, um, they they were they were they, they were um, clear clear in condemning those attacks, um, which which we've mentioned. But um, but at the same time, um, you know, journalists here and the HKJA has, has, has commented on this, don't, you know, f- feel it's a particularly conducive environment and, and not a very supportive administration um, when it comes to taking interests on. Um, you know, I, I guess uh, the, fundamentally your point is whether the FCO and, and the UK government has been uh, sticking by as part of the joint declaration and speaking out on those issues. I think that's, that's a political question which I'm, I'm not entirely qualified to answer, but I can only relate the feeling here among many, which is perhaps that the UK does have uh, a, a moral responsibility to speak out, and, and some some would say it hasn't spoken out as forcefully as it might have done. Mm. I mean, can, may I just pursue that with you, if, if you don't mind? I mean, you know, we are concerned that the UK government isn't speaking out more robustly. But what realistically can the UK government do to protect freedom of speech? and the freedom of the press as outlined in the joint declaration. I mean, what if you could, you know, had a, had a, uh, a blank sheet, what would you want to see the UK government do? And perhaps more importantly, what effect do you think it would have? 
I think speaking out for so I mean let's be realistic here you know there, there is there is limited room for maneuver when it comes to um, applying um, you know sp specific pressure points here the, the UK doesn't have those I would say um, but there is value nevertheless in, 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 in making a declaration sticking by it and speaking out when you feel the declaration on the other side of, of the other parties to that declaration is falling short um, and you know we, 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 we get the sense that um, for instance I, I can make one comparison where the, the, the Americans were, were very uh, through the consulate here were, were issued some very pointed language earlier, early, earlier in the year on, on a number of fronts regarding press freedom here. We haven't seen similar language or at least not until very late in the day have we seen similar language from the UK. Now what effect that, that has, I, you know, that it's debatable but um, the, the protesters here or, or let me leave aside protesters. I'm not qualified to talk about what, what motivates protesters. Let me talk about what, what the media here might benefit from. Um, they, they, they want to know that the world has their back. And, and, and the one country that is as qualified, uniquely qualified to have a moral say in this is, is the UK, is the, former, is the former administrator here. I could also say that if, if press freedom is protected by law here, which it is, that stems in part from the Joint Declaration. It, it stems in part from the Bill of Rights Ordinance that was brought into effect in the early 1990s under British administration, mm -hmm. um, which reflects the guarantees uh, that, are, that are contained in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, signed by Britain and extended uh, to Hong Kong. I think there should be fora available to discuss what might be perceived as, as possible violations of those agreements. Uh, I think it's for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to determine what those fora are. But if you sign something that's registered with the United Nations, that would seem an obvious venue for discussion to me. I don't know what the venue would be for the ICCPR, uh, but there there should be one. And mm -hmm. and and at least to that degree, um, you, you have a, a basis on which I think you could, you could raise concerns. Uh, I also think that uh, press freedom should fall under universal rights because of the right to express information and the right to receive it, which is stated in Article 19 of the ICCPR. The, the um, specific is, point here is, is that the UK government <laughs> felt strongly enough in the 80s and 90s to have this written into the Joint Declaration in the face of, of a lot of resistance in Beijing. Um, if it feels now, if, if and, and many um, in the media here feel that now feel that th those those that language is not being is not being respected in full. Um, having fought for it then, should the UK not, and, and this is the view here, should the UK not now be speaking out more? Just very briefly, I mean, have you made representations to the FCO out there, to um, our Consul General and all the rest of it, about this? And if so, what has been the feedback, um, if, if at all? I mean, what, what, is, had... what has been your impression of things? We've had meetings with um, your colleagues from the House of Commons, um, a couple of delegations who've been um, who've come out on fact-finding trips, and, and we've we've spoken to them um, to to uh, over the over the last few months to relay our our own concerns in in fora where we've joined colleagues from the Hong Kong Journalists Association and and other um, uh, followers of the media scene in Hong Kong. So. Um, we, we've and, and those meetings have been joined by by um, uh, members of the consulate. So I think uh, um, our, our voice, our, our message is, is certainly out there and, and should have, should be clear. And we've met with EU uh, representatives as well. So the consulates were represented in those yeah. meetings. Yes, but very briefly, because um, I'm conscious other colleagues have got questions. But have you actually made representations? I mean, we we are put doing a report, and our job is to scrutinise the UK government's response to this issue. Have you made representations to FCO officials or to the Foreign Office about how you see the situation, and if so, what has been the response? I take the point about colleagues visiting, but I'm, I, I, I want you to address your remarks, if you don't mind, please, to actually government officials. Do you mean in the sense that have we written formally to relay our, our, our concerns to the consular here? No, but we've, yeah. we've, well, we've written, sat. Yeah. Written or spoken or in any other way made representations to government yes. officials, not, not yes. MPs, but officials. And what has been the response, may I ask? 
uh, very polite listening to our concerns. But doing, but in your view, doing not enough. In other words, not well, doing we, enough. We would always like more, but I, I, I don't know what was done when I was not present. All I know is that we express our views, uh, and your Consul General would have heard them very clearly uh, in meetings that we've had. Uh, but what's what's been done after those discussions is something to which we're not privy. Okay, thank you. Just on that point, could you just clarify when you say that you met uh, fellow par parliamentarians, uh, our colleagues, um, do, could you tell us what groups those were? Who, 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 who were they or was it an all-party group or? It was an all-party group. There was one group from the Lords that was, um, when was that, June? It was in the summer, um, and prior to that, there was an all-party group of MPs. Um, these were all off the record, mind. I mean, we were we were invited mm. to give our uh, give our views on on an off the record basis, and um, um, and and we met with you know the, these delegations. And plus the EU meetings that I mentioned. Yeah. Okay. On, on a specific in in relation to the six monthly report. Um, what would the effect be in Hong Kong if, in that six-monthly report, uh, there was a much stronger line on uh, on protection of press freedom? I don't want to second guess what the coverage would be if 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 the report were to say something along those lines. But what I can say is that any time the UK government issues any kind of language on Hong Kong, it gets reported everywhere um, in all the in all the in all the the, the print and, and uh, broadcast media. Um, people here are listening and, and are looking the cues from London to see what the view is and that gets reported extensively. Um, and and it will get spun extensively depending on, on the media group involved, what their what their position is on, on, on these issues of, of pro or pro-China, pro-democracy, whatever the rival camps are. But um, fundamentally, uh, you, 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 you're, you're guaranteed a, a wide audience. Can I ask you, how, uh, how is the UK generally perceived in, in Hong Kong, and has that perception changed over time? It's, so how is it perceived and has it the, changed? The, the, I suppose um, you, you the trajectory has been a, an outpouring of, of, of patriotic fervour around, uh, mingled with some anxiety about what the future would hold under Chinese rule, but also a strong sense of, 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 of patriotism at, at, at Hong Kong's return to the motherland. That has ebbed over time, and um, I would say the UK's um, standing here has, 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 has never been so good. Um, and that, but a lot of that is, is a reaction to what is seen as heavy-handed. Uh, officious handling of Hong Kong by by China. You've seen um, um, the Union Jack and the Hong Kong colonial flag uh, staging a revival at at, um, at at protests and rallies. Um, a lot of that is, you know, that that's not a genuine. Nobody's gen seriously talking about, you know, trying to campaign for Hong Kong to, to return to British rule. But it's very much a a, a one in the eye. For, 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 for the mainland government, it's a way of, of registering protest in quite an extreme way when, when you have a government in China that is so uh, wrapped up in the flag and, and patriot, patriotism itself. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, can I just explore a little bit further about the role of the UK government and how it's perceived? I mean, we've had witnesses before say that we could be more robust. I say we, I mean, talk about the UK government. Um, or, and certainly the FCO, more robust in its language. We've heard certain human rights groups describe the response so far as feeble. Um, I, I, can you give us a sense from your point of view, from the press's point of view, as to how that's, that perception is being played out in Hong Kong? I, I sense you think it's reasonably fair, the criticism. Um, but, you know, what is your take on that more specifically? What could the UK government do more? And can I bring you back to the question and press you, if I may, what effect would it have? I mean, we do live in an information age. You know, winning the argument is important. Um, do you think it would do the protesters any good? I, 
I mean, it's it's we're, we're straying into territory. That I'm not really qualified to to talk if 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 what if what you mean by that is you know what could the UK do to help uh, this or that lobby this this or that interest group. You know, what I can say from our perspective in the FCC is that we are worried about the climate of press freedom in Hong Kong. That press freedom is enshrined as a fundamental liberty. Um, and, 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 and that liberty is, is guaranteed under an agreement that was uh, jointly signed by the UK government and, and indeed only came about because of pressure from the UK government. And so at a time when many in the media here are worried about uh, intimidation or outright violence, um, uh, more worried than at any point since the handover, then the one of the two original signatories to that agreement might want to say, if, uh, say a bit more about that. The, the statement that's appeared in any number of reports has always been the one country systems appears to be working well, et cetera, et cetera. You can find that, I think, in virtually every one of the reports. When it's been quite obvious to people on the ground here that the second system has been under increasing pressure from the one country. So I, I think perhaps um, taking a second look at, at that boilerplate and examining it more closely uh, might be useful. But beyond that, uh, I can't say what you should or should not do to assist any particular group of protesters. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Joshi, Mr. Mor Moriarty, that, that completes our line of questioning. Is there anything you'd like to say in, uh, to wrap this up in conclusion? Um, no, just to thank you for your time and, 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 uh, and perhaps we, we look forward to um, having this discussion discussion with you in person at some point. Uh, I would second that. And can, and can I just say that, it, it, that uh, uh, for journalists in Hong Kong who are out on the front line, and I speak particularly of my local colleagues, uh, it's, it's sometimes a very lonely position to be in, and sometimes a very scary confrontational one, as we saw during the recent events. Um, so having someone, to use JIT's term, uh, covering your back. Uh, is, is, is a meaningful thing, um, even if it's only in document form. Well, great. Well, we're, we are uh, quite clearly watching this very closely, and your input is hugely appreciated. You've given us a, an angle and a dimension perhaps we, did, we haven't been looking at closely enough. Yeah. So it, it's very much valued. So on behalf of the committee, can I thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. If you could say to the administrators, you know, keep the line open, and we're expecting the next people in about five minutes. Perhaps the next time at the FCC. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> in the bar. It's a great club. You should come visit in person if you can. All right. Your briefcase, Jim? Jim, is that your briefcase? No. Yeah. I'm trying to mute this because everything's being recorded that you say at the moment and, and if we put it up on the website it'll all go out. <laughs> and these your papers all here? Yeah. Yeah.
道家呢度，係啦，咁就會清楚啲。呢、這個啊，好得曬呢個，係啦 ，Alan 呢度，係啦，咁就會 OK。Good morning, afternoon rather. Good morning, good day. <laughs> Thank you both very much for coming on. For the record, do you think you could identify yourselves? Your name and position. I'm Alan Long, uh, Chairman Hong Kong Democratic Foundation. And I'm Simon Young, uh, Professor and Associate Dean in the Faculty of Law, Hong Kong University. Great, thank you. Um, are you uh, uh, are you both aware that this is an on the record session and that we are recording it? Yes, yes. And, uh, good, good. Thank you very much. Well, look, can I can I thank you both hugely for coming in? It's um, I'm I'm only too sorry that we're not with you in person, um, as famously we've been banned from coming to see you, and so, but thanks to modern technology, we can still have this conversation. Right. Um, can, we, can we talk about um, the recent protests in Hong Kong? And it'd be helpful to us if you could set out what you saw as the main goals of the of the student protesters. You first. Okay. Uh, maybe I, I can begin. Um, I think uh, the main goal was directed at the Standing Committee's decision of August 31st, uh, which set some pretty strict conditions on the nomination process. Um, and people were quite surprised by those conditions. They seemed to be more conservative than any, any proposal that had been presented to the government. Um, and so they were directly, uh, they were, so the protests were directed at, at that decision. Um, that's the primary uh, uh, target. I think the secondary target was the Hong Kong government and how it conducted the whole political reform exercise. Uh, and that's why you, you saw calls at the early stages, uh, not only for the reversal of the Standing Committee's decision, but also for government officials to step down, including the chief executive. Uh, so there was some ha unhappiness with how the government had conducted this reform process. Um, nobody seems to be sure why the, uh, so to speak, the NPC standing committee slammed the gate so hard, and that was still a mystery. And as Professor Simon Young said, the protest was for democracy, that to uh, a petition to give more room in the constitutional reform process. But nobody seems to know why, because just before the, uh, the so-called slamming of the gate, many were talking about uh, 
asking the NPC to give as much room as possible. Why it happened is, is still mis mystery. And of course, the protest is, is not about uh, any anti-China -move movement. It was all about asking for the promise to be fulfilled, the, the universal that Hong Kong wants genuine choice. As, as I understand it, the, what really sparked things off was the white paper when it was published um, uh, um, in June of this year. Do you think that that white paper marked a shift towards a more limited interpretation of autonomy in Hong Kong? I, I, I look at the uh, white paper slightly differently from what the mass media reported. Uh, China as a whole, and including the uh, the mainland uh, Beijing leadership has never been very good at the so-called we understand as public relations or, or good communication. They, they are very used to this very top-down style of communication. I'm the uh, power, you listen. The way I saw it, the white paper, there was nothing new in the white paper. I, I, my opinion is almost the same as Tim Summers' paper. There were, there were major error uh, or interpretation of the rule of law in the, uh, in the white paper. That was the main thing. Uh, rule of law as understood as in China is not rule of law, it's rule by law. And rule of law, the concept is really well understood in Hong Kong, even by the popular press, by the average person in the street that it's not just has to be fair, it has to be seen to be fair. That is not the understanding. And their, their, their interpretation that the judiciary is part of the administration is obviously wrong. And I think they now realize it and they could be reviewing not just their communication, but the, this so-called two system in Hong Kong, that Hong Kong runs a different judicial system. Let me just add that I share Alan's view on this, that I think there was a tendency for some to uh, give this, uh, see this document as, as a greater threat than it really was uh, in its terms. Um, but it was of such concern that you did see lawyers coming out to protest. You had about a thousand lawyers marching. And you also saw the former chief justice uh, coming out and making some very strong words, uh, again, saying some very strong words about the white paper. Uh, so there was enough there to get people concerned. Um, but I think, as Alan has suggested, part of the problem was simply a problem of communication and, and poorly understanding the Hong Kong common law system of rule of law. Do, do you think that um, the requirement that judges should be, quote, patriotic was a rather odd thing to, to find in the paper? How do you define Patriot, patriotic. <laughs> Does it mean as to shoe shine, you know, bosses up there as much as possible? I flag waving. That's how I describe it. <laughs> yeah. Does it mean that if you say things they like to hear, you get favors, political or commercial? So how do you define patriotism? This is a concept that really cannot be adequately defined by law. There could be. Some, some of the things can be sedition, uh, uh, negative things. You can define things negatively. But how do you define that somebody is more patriotic than, than I or right, than yeah. Simon? Well, well, that is one of the things that the former Chief Justice Andrew Lee had uh, said in his writing on this, on the white paper. He said that there needed to be clarification. Uh, what do you mean by patriotic? Do you mean patriotic in one's decision making or patriotic simply in taking the judicial oath because I think everyone here is very content with judges taking the judicial oath as a sign of patriotism but if it reaches as far as actually how you go about deciding cases uh, then that goes it seems to go too far um, may, may, may I add, add just yeah. one comment that that's um, this is not to say that 
we know we've, we've been sort of blaming mainland officials or mainland China as a whole, but Hong Kong is not totally faultless. Hong Kong, average Hong Kong really doesn't understand uh, the Chinese system or China's aspiration. And together with this, uh, the common turn, the Communist International Constitution of China of I believe nine, 1919 or something, which talked, which defined democracy as democratic centralism. Of course, there's big conflict of this constitution, of this concept of the, of the state, with the very diehard liberalism of Hong Kong. I mean, you cannot take the, the, the liberalism of Hong Kong away. Hong Kong is absolutely, absolutely down to the very bottom liberal. And you cannot change that. Nobody can change that. So with, with that with that point in mind, how do you think China sees its role in exercising sovereignty over Hong Kong? Well, I mean, first, first and foremost, and consistent with the basic law, it sees itself conducting Hong Kong's uh, foreign affairs and defense. Uh, as it does for the whole country. Uh, secondly, it sees that it has to protect national security. And that's why it gets very upset by the fact that while Macau has been able to pass national security laws, Hong Kong has not. Uh, and thirdly, it sees itself as watching over the political system. Um, and so therefore, this is why uh, we are in this dilemma of how much autonomy does Hong Kong have in deciding its political system? In, uh, in one of the prepare notes, I said, um, China, you know, as we all know, China will become very irrational if Taiwan declare independence. Or they become, they will become, they will defend their sovereignty at all costs. They will, they will fight even if they, if they know that they have a good chance of losing the war. But this is China. The same for Hong Kong. If they think sovereignty is at risk, they will become very, very irrational. There are people, mainland officials, as well as people in Hong Kong that, you know, say that they represent mainland's view, but in this, main system. Who is, who really make the, the final decision? We all know it's the Politburo, seven people in the Politburo. And in recently, the power is even more concentrated, you know, in, in the form of Xi Jinping. So the final decision is not never made on Hong Kong political development, how they treat Hong Kong until it gets to Xi Jinping's level. I tried to show a picture to many people, this picture of the uh, main front, front page picture uh, you of Ming Kao. You may need to describe it more. Right. Uh, this, is a picture of, I, I, this is a picture of uh, Xi Jinping uh, receiving Xi uh, Wailong in Beijing during APEC. And the, the people that there are really normally running Hong Kong affairs are not there. Even the head of the Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office is sitting on the uh, least important position. And the, the, and the one sitting in the most important position next or to the left of Xi Jinping is actually someone called Huang Huning. And people of, the, of your foreign office will recognize him. He's the foreign affairs Affair advisor of Xi Jinping. And I actually show the same picture to uh, one of your former, former uh, foreign FCO of, uh, official, Tim Summers. And he, he was immediately able to tell me, oh, we're winning, oh, he served three party secretary. And the one to the left, the head of uh, this CCP central office, CCP central committee office. Oh, he's quite, quite your party secretary. Oh, I know him, blah, 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 and so on. They are obviously people within your foreign office who knows China extremely well, but this is not common knowledge in Hong Kong. Yeah. And who makes the final decision? You know, it's really even for us 
who read Chinese newspaper, and we have here, and some of us read Chinese blocks, mainland blocks, is still reading tea leaves because you know, the mainland system is not transparent. But the thing we know is decision is made on Hong Kong. This picture tells us decision made on Hong Kong is now at the very, very top level, particularly on Occupy Central. Thank you. Um, That's helpful. Thank you. Mike Gates. Yes. Um, both of you um, submitted proposals during the first round of the public consultation in Hong Kong, suggesting potential reforms to the process uh, for the election of the chief executive in 2017. Um, in, line, in line with Article 45 of the Basic Law, um, can you can you explain can you explain what you propose uh, for us? Um, what, what your proposed reforms of the process would be? Okay, uh, me first. Um, I think to to really to judge uh, the central leadership, which is. This, the Politburo really, or even Xi Jinping, will grant the so-called genuine choice to Hong Kong. You really have to look at their action and not the hot air, every, the people, the uh, you know people who are trying to be political, politically correct, glowing all around, all around. The proposal I, I've prepared is this proposal conforms to the basic law. And the uh, joint and the declaration, most recent declaration by MPCSC, totally. Whether mainland uh, the leadership will grant it, we we don't know. And I, I'll describe it in a very simple terms. Uh, there are three step entry screening, which everybody was screaming screaming about, and exit. Entry is the proposal is very simple. One eighth of the 1,200 uh, nomination committee member, which is the same as before. Uh, the Democrats have proven that, that they can nominate someone through this. Then there's a second step NPC requires it be screened down to two or three candidates, which is very specific, but didn't say exactly how you could screen it. Our proposal is to. Uh, to, to have the screening done exclusively by electrical members. To be screened into those two or three people, you have to get 20 votes. The advantage of this is really turning this very negative aspect of screening into a very positive aspect, because it builds the links between the executive branch and the legislative branch that is missing. Now, imagine how could, for example, your government run without your support. It's impossible. How does Obama run the uh, uh, US, con con US government if he has zero votes in Congress and the Senate? And this is exactly the situation in Hong Kong. So this at least give 20 votes to the future, except future uh, chief executive. So will they allow it? We don't know. Finally, the exit, which is the most controversial part. Exit requires, according to the NPC uh, requirement, it requires 50% approval by the nomination committee. We stole, we actually stole a an idea from a group of the so-called group of 13 scholars, which use a, an economic theory for like called game theory, theory, which state that the 50% must be by the, for the entire list. They could reject or accept the entire list of two or three. If they reject it, a nomination goes back to the beginning again. And presumably, because voters are, are rational, they could presumably replace the person rejected by someone who's more acceptable to the uh, entire nomination committee, therefore Beijing. This is still a controversial part, but you know, is the glass half full or half empty? Is Hong Kong a, an independent state? 
how do you address Beijing's worry that the CE, who really has a provincial governor status, work against the central government? So at least the last exit, 50% approval by entirely address their concern to some concern uh, to some extent. So this is simply, in very simple words, the, the proposal that could happen. We don't know if Beijing will consider it. We don't even know the pandemic legislator will consider it. So this is the situation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I'll just I'll just try to explain what my proposal is. And first, let me sort of situated in the debates that were happening at the time, because at that time we didn't know that they would come on so strongly with those three restrictions. We thought they wouldn't, we weren't exactly sure. So you had this sort of spectrum of different proposals. So at the far liberal end was those so-called proposals that advocated civic nomination, giving the people the, the right to nominate if you had a certain number, 1%, 2% of the electorate. Uh, but the, there have been some very clear signs from both the Hong Kong government and the Beijing government that they, that would not be accepted. Uh, so I tried to avoid the civic nomination in the pure form proposal. And then at the other end, of course, is, is what the, some of the DAB, the pro-China groups were advocating, which again, looked a lot like what came down in the end. Uh, so I tried to move away from that. The status quo, of course, was not a bad situation uh, because, as Alan mentioned, the status quo, when you just get the one-eighth from 1,200, was able to at least return a Democrat. So I think most people would be happy with the status quo, but people weren't so happy with the makeup of the nominating committee. So people wanted to see that changed as well. But then there were also demands for the civic nomination. And so my proposal sort of gets situated between civic nomination and the status quo, because I thought that they wouldn't accept the status quo because the threshold would be too low. Because when you look at Article 45, it talks about nomination by the committee as a whole, not just one eighth. So my proposal was to have a two track system. The one track would be, is that you get the nomination by the committee by a vote, right? Uh, and if you are the top three in terms of getting number of votes, uh, then you can be in. The other track is if you have public support, and I describe this as public nomination, not public, uh, uh, sorry, uh, civic endorsement, not uh, civic nomination, but civic endorsement, plus the lower threshold, that is the one eighth threshold, then you could also come in. Right? So through these two ways, I tried to come up with a more or less compromise solution that is respectful of the language of 45, Article 45, but also has the element of the civic nomination. Uh, but of course, we now know that uh, Beijing did not accept either of these. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Long, uh, the um, Hong Kong Democratic Foundation sent us a, a written submission arguing that the National People Congress uh, August 31st decision um, contravened the basic law and the joint declaration. Can you explain why you think that the uh, decision of the National People's Congress contravenes the basic law and joint declaration? Um, it's, it's difficult for me to, to argue about this because this submission was written by George, Co was submitted by George Copley. And oh, okay. It's, it's difficult, I mean, even if you argue this, this is quite useless because the power is with the sovereign power of China. So th there are arguments, legal arguments, many, many ways you can, you know, lawyers can argue many ways, but what is the point? Okay, thank you. Uh, now that the, um, the protests have essentially ended over the last few days. Um, where do you think the political reform process will go from here? And could you explain if you think there's any scope for compromise? Let me, let me begin uh, on that one. Um, I think there is scope for compromise. I mean, this is my own personal view. Uh, I've recently written an article in the Hong Kong Law Journal 
uh, and it's titled uh, Realizing Universal Suffrage in Hong Kong After the Standing Committee's Decision. Uh, and so I espouse a view, probably a minority view now, that even with the conditions imposed on August 31st, it's still possible to uh, design a system that uh, is consistent with the idea of universal suffrage. Um, but both sides would need to compromise and they need to sit down. And I think the crucial element in my proposal is the power of the people to reject all the candidates. Right? So what we're left with with the Standing Committee's decision is essentially de facto Beijing control over nominations. But they don't have control over the election itself, the election result. That's still up for discussion. And I submit in my paper is that if we can give that power effectively to the people, then we can have a balanced system. Because that power in the people to reject all the candidates effectively will uh, determine or, or, or affect how Beijing goes about the nomination process, that, that realistically Beijing will have to come up with people that have the support of the people, uh, candidates that have the support of the people. Um, so, so that's just in terms of idea. I, I espouse the view that there's still a lot of room for discussion um, here. Now, the other thing that has to happen, unfortunately, I think, is that the government needs to come up with better process. Um, the, the, the Chief Secretary, Kerry Lam, has already talked about establishing a kind of multi-party platform. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure if that's the best proposal, but at least they're at least talking about different mechanisms to have together people's views. I propose that there should be some kind of independent consultation committee that helps the government conduct the consultation exercise led by a very credible, probably former judge or sitting judge uh, that could give a lot of credibility to the system and provides a forum for the protesters to have their voices heard in an effective way. So these are the kinds of things that, that I think many people are, are, are hoping to see uh, occur. I think one of the uh, very amazing things to students and Occupy Central has achieved is that it actually uh, made the leadership in Beijing and uh, Hong Kong, including the students and activists, agree on one thing, that uh, the economic policy that has been practiced in Hong Kong after 1997 is not working. Uh, the focus, the favor, too much favor given to the uh, property tycoons, too much uh, emphasis put on the financial market. And opportunities are not, opportunities to the, the young people are basically ignored. They keep ignoring them. And there are housing problems, blah, 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 and so on. And I think the, that is understood according to my reading of the Chinese new, from the Chinese new pace, newspaper. That aspect, economic development aspect, is well understood by uh, by the leadership in, in Beijing already. So that there will be change perhaps in the innovation and technology, more job creation at the, at, at the high end, which uh, UK could play a strong role in assisting Hong Kong in moving towards this development. But the political order of post-occupied central is far from finalized because it's a very, very difficult situation. On one hand, uh, there are demands, uh, slightly extreme demands, like like uh, uh, civic nomination demanded by a student. That is not going to happen. And then there, there's the inability to communicate on Beijing, the fear that the chief executive will work against Hong Kong, the fear that even people people like Simon and I <laughs> coming to talk to you are subversive and we're anti-China and, and we are linking up with uh, very bad forces, external forces. And this is the, uh, the uh, hot air blown, up by, blown out by some people in Hong Kong. But those people actually have more influence than people like us, of course, mainland China. So really, 
in terms of post-occupied post -occupied central, the political development, inter the international community, including people like you, the UK government, the Germans, the Americans, the European Union, actually has a very important role to play. Because remember, we are the good boys, good boys and girls, I should say. <laughs> we never asked for independence. We never, never did. Truly, truly, we never did. And our demonstration has been peaceful. It was non-violent. In Hong Kong, there's no end to, to no good ending, no good outcome for Hong Kong. There could be no good ending for the dependence for Xinjiang and also some internal problems, other problems China is facing. And I'm sure you're, uh, as a foreign affairs committee, you're aware of all those things. And I, I do not, I do not you know, subscribe to the theory that China is an evil empire, you know, because we, it, it is not. As part of China, we cannot say those things. And they try, on one hand, they are trying very, very hard to become almost a world citizen, trying to play in useful roles in, in, uh, in, in the world affairs. And they do care very much about what the international community think about them. So you do have a role in perhaps the calming effect and uh, try to convince not just us in Hong Kong, but mainland China to act on hope and not on fear. If everything, if everyone, including uh, perhaps uh, some of your colleagues within your group is acting on fear, oh, humiliated. I, I know it's difficult to take to, to refuse entry and, and you do feel humiliated. But you do, you do, you can have a very, you know, strong calming effect on China, on working with them to assist Hong Kong's con not just constitutional de development, but our very, our, our, we have a major deficits in policy development. I hate to say that when the Brits left, we were not able to make policy choice and make policy de decisions or policy development. That, that, may come the, that may come up in some of the later questions from Mother Cole. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, the time is running a bit short, so if I can keep things moving. John Barron. Uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, the committee is looking at whether the UK government, because our role at the end of the day is to scrutinise our, our own government and the FCO, um, is looking at to see whether the UK government has been robust enough in speaking up for the protest movement, the democratic movement in Hong Kong. Um, how would you assess the UK government's response to recent developments in Hong Kong, um, specifically since the publication of the white paper in June of this year? Do you think it has been robust enough? Um, well, I think generally speaking, most foreign governments have been very quiet uh, in the past uh, couple of months um, and I think you know for good reasons uh, because uh, if you're just looking at this narrow period of this time speaking up you know would not have helped the protesters probably uh, because uh, because of these allegations because of the very poisoned environment of suggesting that there's foreign interference uh, so I think it was very wise probably not to uh, say too much in this environment. Um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think there's contention over the uh, position taken by the uh, FCO of welcoming China's objective and the details of the constitutional package for government is for Hong Kong government and the Chinese government and the people for Hong Kong to decide without mentioning the joint declaration. That was perhaps the uh, contention. But we know, because we have links with your consul, uh, consulate general in Hong Kong, we know everyone, almost everyone, who wrote the six-monthly report. And we know that uh, both former and current uh, officials working in the, in the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office are sinologists. 
they have deep knowledge of China, which is the one I mentioned, who told me everything I don't know about China. And because of their deep knowledge, of course their judgment could be slightly different from Hong Kong and from people who are not non-Sinologists. You know, they speak better Kutonghua than we do, honestly, because we're Cantonese speakers. And we always stutter when we speak in the, in the, in the Mandarin. And that is not a fault. That is actually, a, that is a main, a, a very particular feature of the British Foreign Service. And those, I believe some of your people could be hurt if you accuse them of not doing their job. I know that, I, I know that they, they have Hong Kong's best interest at heart. And there are people who have different opinion. That's fine in a democratic society. That, that, that is normal. But I trust, I personally, I trust their judgment because they can tell me that things I don't know. Whether you, 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 you the foreign, foreign affairs uh, committee blame them or say, oh, they're not doing, they're doing their job, but in my opinion, they, they are doing the best they could to, to serve not just us, not just you, but us. <laughs> mm. And I think they're trying, trying to best serve China's interests too. You're being very magnanimous. We, the previous witnesses, not just today, but previous witnesses in other sessions, has suggested that they feel the UK government could have been a little bit more robust. After all, there are obligations on both sides of the joint declaration. Um, so may I press you on this? Um, you, what you're saying basically is you feel that they've got a difficult course to set and you, as uh, from where you are, are satisfied that the British government has done what it can in speaking out on behalf of the protest movement. Um, and can I also ask you to address perhaps the more relevant question, and that is, even if, we, if the government did speak out, what impact do you think it would have? And if I may pick you up, uh, uh, Mr. Lung, um, on something you said earlier, that the Chinese government does care about how it is perceived on the international stage. I put it to you, therefore, being devil's advocate, do you not think criticism, more robust criticism, within the spirit of the joint declaration, could have more of an effect on the Chinese government and authorities than you give it credit for? Me? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Yeah. I think yeah. the uh, strong criticism public criticism uh, to the Chinese because of the system, public criticism, you, you, you have to be quite careful because it could be misconstrued as anti-China. I do know that uh, a different government, uh, largest uh, country in Europe, do criticize uh, China in private and very strong criticism. And I was told this is the only government that has human rights dialogues between China and uh, this country. The, the Chinese fear uh, the sovereignty issue and they do not see this sort of dialogue. I must say that it's important to be politically correct in mainland China, because the politics is not transparent. And you do not know what forces are still going on in, 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 in China, even at this moment. So I encourage you to criticize them strongly, perhaps behind closed doors first, and publicly take care of their concern about their sovereignty issue. They are, they are very sensitive, particularly versus UK. Perhaps they're not, not, not as sensitive with the Germans. Perhaps the Germans, Karl Marx and Engels were Germans and they trust them more. Perhaps they, they perceive that, <laughs> that the Germans are more direct and this is something they can, they can deal with. We don't know. 
I mean, it's, it's a strong relationship that some government has, and this is something diplomats are very good at building. And perhaps because you're diplomats to your Foreign Affairs Committee, and just don't sort of stir up their fear, stir up their hope. And this is the major, major, if, if, I want, if, if the, uh, you know, the strategic direction you could consider taking. Um, but we're not diplomats, we're members of parliament, so uh, um, could I ask you about the six monthly reports that the FCO produces? Um, they have never identified a breach of the joint declaration. Do you agree with them? Uh, I, as a, as a lawyer, I, I would generally agree. I mean, this, this, the situation we're in right now is not a clear breach of the joint declaration or, or the basic law. We're still trying to work out the meaning of universal suffrage as it is to be implemented under the one country, two system uh, uh, f framework. Um, and I think the argument that China has been making, probably the strongest argument, is that since Hong Kong is not an independent uh, country, uh, since the chief executive has to be accountable to the central government, um, they should have some say uh, over how that process works. Uh, and that's an argument I think is very difficult to refute. Um, how much say is, is the very question. And that is what I think we're still working out. And as I said earlier, there's still a lot of question marks about what the system will look like. Uh, because uh, firstly, we're only talking about the chief executive. We haven't even gotten to the legislature yet and the functional constituencies there. Uh, so if we can, through a, a rational process of negotiation and bargaining, um, we are able to come up with a system that has proper balance and counterbalance, it may well still be consistent with the joint declaration and basic law. Um, I think uh, uh, the ultimate safeguard, of course, is the two-thirds veto or the one-third veto of the legislature, right? Because uh, this is not something that we're forced to take, right? You have to remember that the amendment formula allows legislatures, one-third of them, to veto any political reform. That's the ultimate uh, uh, safeguard here. Uh, so we're trying to, of course, avoid that. Right? We're trying to avoid that so that we can have universal suffrage. Um, but uh, it's not so clear that there's a breach. So you believe I know that... that's... Sorry. I'm sorry? Go on. Go on. I, I know that uh, in uh, George Colley's mission, he argued for a breach. A breach. Um, that is a very contentious position because we know that the Hong Kong ICR government and, and, the, and the Chinese government immediately argue that the joint declaration never mentioned uni universal suffrage. Even if in all our, all our proposal, constitutional proposal, reform proposal, we never rely on the uh, joint declaration, we rely on the basic law totally. And going down this argument, whether they, there is a bridge or not a bridge, to me is really, really irre irrelevant. Because we know that the, the uh, Beijing government will argue the other way, and we will never win. <laughs> so why go down this, this argument in, in, in the first place? It simply stir up, stir up fear. And it is not good for, uh, for our sake. It is not good for uh, Hong Kong as we move forward. I much prefer that the constitutional ref reform argument would be based totally on the basic law, because this is the Chinese, part of the Chinese constitution. That's my point of view. <laughs> so you think the rights and freedoms of the, the joint declaration are being upheld? Um, I think even in, in the press very lately, uh, the uh, Chen Zhuo'e, former JL Joint Liaison Group chief Chinese representative, would not dare to say that the uh, joint declaration is null and void. He only said, the spirit of the joint declaration is alive and well. 
And I think this is the, the factor, the fear factor, the foreign, your committee should be aware of. If you six keep accusing that there is a bridge, they will become quite irrational because they think their international reputation and their sort of sovereign rights on Hong Kong is threatened. That is never, never a good line or a good strategy to take for our sake. I think um, I said to uh, one of your senior officials, Julian King, when, when we, met, we met him, that uh, we like Chris, you know, there are lots of fans of Chris Patton in, in Hong Kong. And I'm one of them. I, I like I like him very very much. I like his accent. I wait, like the way he say things <laughs> in his presentation. And he's actually closely linked to, to us. And I really really like this tart eating, flesh flashing governor of Hong Kong. But the tone of his argument to me, uh, this antagonistic attitude towards China, that it's almost like a deja vu is honorable retreat again. You know, it should have happened 70 years, years before. It's not helpful to Hong Kong ICR passport holder like us. We, I hold no foreign passport and we're stuck. And whether we like it or not, we have to make this constitutional sort of reform work. We cannot afford not to. China can afford not to. So whether you, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee will help us convince China that democracy is good for mm -hmm. Hong Kong, uh, good for China, not just for, good for Hong Kong. It's a critical, critical you know, strategy and direction you should consider and I hope you, you take. Can I just say a few things about rights and freedoms? Um, we're now, of course, de we're de debating political rights, but if you ask about all other rights and freedoms, um, then they are very much intact and protected, primarily because of our independent judiciary. So if China doesn't meddle with the judiciary, we're going to be okay. And so far they haven't. Right? So our uh, judiciary has adopted a very robust approach to protecting constitutional rights. Uh, and and, and uh, when one reads the judgments, particularly the ones from the Court of Final Appeal, where you have the sitting foreign judge. Many judges from the UK, at the highest level, have sat in our cases. These are very inspiring judgments. At the policy level, could government do more to protect human rights? I think definitely yes. But I think that's just more of a, a symptom of lack of democracy and policymaking, as Alan's mentioned earlier. Uh, but if at the level of the courts, we're still very good. Thank you. Can I thank you both very much? I'm afraid time has caught up with us. Um, and I'm only too sorry that we're not sitting on the other side of the table with you having this conversation. But can I thank you both very much indeed. It's been really, really helpful to us and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you do come to Hong Kong sometime. And you, I'm, I'm sure people in Hong Kong will welcome you. We'll come tomorrow if they let us. But, uh, <laughs> Um, could you tell the administrators we'll take a two or three minute break right. while the next person Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we'll take it. Thank you. Four or three minutes. Yeah, no problem. No problem.
未開始，要等多啲。好平嘅問題，出邊嗰啲男仔係咪㗎？佢唔入嚟。O K， 唔係咁。誒、呃、要三分鐘，佢佢一陣會嗌嚟嘅，你等等。誒、呃，你預六點整一號。得冇問題。Thank you. Hello, Yvonne. Can you hear? Hello. Yes. I'm Kenneth Fox, I'm the committee yes. clerk. I'm just saying this at the moment. This is being recorded. The chairman will come in back into the room and he'll have a discussion with you. Whether this will be on the record, but for now we're going okay. to mute, and you may want to mute your end because everything is being recorded and will be included on the tape. So we're going to mute okay. this end for a minute. You might want to do the same, and then the chairman will come back in a minute and have a discussion with you. Okay. No is that problem. clear? Thanks. Great. Thanks. Good afternoon, Yvonne. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, very nice to talk to you. Thank you for coming along. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Yvonne, uh, ca ca can we establish the basis of this conversation? Are you, do you want it to be in private or are you happy to have it on the record? Uh, it's okay. It's okay to be on record. Good. Excellent. Well, um, so you're, we're, we will be recording this. And uh, and then it, it goes on to our website, basically. Okay, no problem. Lovely, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, could you identify yourself and your position for the record, please? Okay, uh, so I'm the representative of the Hong Kong Federation of Students, uh, which was an active group participating in the umbrella movement. And uh, actually, we are formulated by the eight students, uh, so, uh, students union uh, in the universities in Hong Kong. And uh, I'm 21 years old, and I'm the president of the uh, Hong Kong USU. So um, I'm here to I pledge to the committee uh, on the recent situation in the political reform in Hong Kong and how there may be potential breach of the duties uh, by the Chinese government in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Okay, we'll, we'll take all those points in a, in a sequence and, and my colleagues here uh, will put questions to you. But could we start by just simply setting out what, what were the main goals of the student protesters during the recent protests? Well, actually, uh, the main goals of the <coughs> students' protest has been uh, calling for a genuine, free and periodic um, election in Hong Kong, which can um, really reflect the free will expression of the Hong Kong people. So it is inconsistent with the ICCPR. And actually, uh, we are here to uh, request for the attention of the Parliament of the United Kingdom uh, also on this issue, because um, we can observe that actually the Sino-British Joint Declaration was uh, a, I would say, contract or uh, a, an international treaty which governs the future of Hong Kong and actually it affects the destiny of the 7.8 million people in Hong Kong. But uh, like throughout these years, we can observe uh, different uh, chances and uh, breaches of the Chinese government on uh, this international treaty. And uh, perhaps because I've actually prepared a few points to elaborate on like how the joint declaration was breached. Okay. So um, can, can, it's okay. Can, yes. can I interrupt? We will get, you have a, a good opportunity in a few minutes time to talk in detail about okay. the joint declaration. So if you could just stay on our questions and then because you want to talk about the joint declaration, we want a slightly wider perspective as well, and I'd be very interested in your views. 
So okay. we'll come to the joint declaration in a minute. Hmm. Um, okay, no. uh, um, what do you think about the? What do you think of the reaction of the Hong Kong and Chinese authorities to, to the protests? Well, uh, I think the Beijing government actually paid um, no direct response. Uh, it did not like um, really respond to the protest directly, but instead. Uh, they just asked the Hong Kong SAR government to uh, respond to the protest. And I would say we were very disappointed uh, with the response by the Hong Kong government because uh, they just used the um, MPCSC decision issued in late August as a shield uh, to refrain the Hong Kong people from attaining a uh, genuine universal suffrage. And when we touch upon the uh, unconstitutional uh, part of the um, MPCSC decision, which means uh, stating its status as uh, an infringement of the basic law provision. Um, so it is like unconstitutional. Uh, the Hong Kong government actually gives no response on that either. So uh, we were very disappointed by both the Hong Kong SAL government and the Beijing government. Do, do, do you think there's any willingness to compromise by the authorities at the moment? Uh, no, actually no. Uh, because like I was one of the representative of um, the students uh, who had a direct conversation with the government, uh, which was like having a live broadcast in Hong Kong. And you can see the government actually uh, did not compromise anything. Uh, instead, they just say they will. Uh, sends, they will file a report on um, the public opinion uh, they observe in these two months, but they won't uh, give any suggestions or any stance to the Beijing government for their consideration, which means um, they will only write into the report that, oh, there is a large scale protest in Hong Kong, while at the same time, there have been other um, like anti-occupy uh, groups who also voice out their opinion. So basically, the report will be nothing uh, bringing Hong Kong nearer to genuine universal suffrage. Great, Frank. Yvonne, on a general point, uh, what are your views on the direction in which Hong Kong is going? And do you think that one country, two systems um, is working well and is sustainable? Uh, it is definitely not working well. Well, actually, uh, I think there are several points uh, we, we, we could go to uh, for investigating into how one country, two systems is actually working. Uh, we can see that uh, in one country, two system, actually the fundamental civil and political rights of Hong Kong citizens should be uh, well preserved. But uh, actually, we can uh, see that over these years uh, from what is stated in the basic law, we could have universal suffrage uh, in the terms subsequent to 2007. Uh, up to this moment, uh, there has been uh, a few times of interpretation of basic law carried out by the uh, National People's Congress, not upon the request by the courts, but instead by the chief executive himself, which is uh, inherently against the basic law provision. But uh, still, uh, up to this moment, we are only promised a um, election, an election uh, with a small circle uh, nomination process, uh, which only seven percent, or even less than seven percent, of the Hong Kong uh, electorate could indirectly elect some representatives of them uh, to further choose the candidates of the chief executive election. The same situation is actually found in the legislature part. Uh, we are still not having universal suffrage in the legislature, and half of the seats are actually uh, functional constituencies, uh, which uh, the representative of Hong Kong people are elected by uh, corporations uh, and only professionals in uh, some of the constituencies, uh, which is definitely not uh, enjoying equal voting rights because we have constituencies like the um, education sector, which has uh, 
around uh, 80,000 of folders, but we have other um, sectors like uh, the fishermen. They are actually held by several hundred of people who have voting rights. So you can see actually none of the sectors or branches of our government uh, is really um, universally elected or fairly elected. So uh, basically there is infringement on um, the fundamental civil and political rights of Hong Kong. And concerning the living style, which is the gist of uh, one country, two system, we can see that uh, over these years, uh, like the freedom of press in Hong Kong, which uh, before the year 2009, actually we were classified by the Freedom House as um, a free region. But after the year 2009, uh, there were subsequent incidents uh, harming the freedom of press in Hong Kong, which made us now only a partially free region. So uh, I think we can really draw a direct correlation between that and the deterioration of uh, the one country, two systems. And uh, actually, the on the judicial part, I think uh, it is the part really worth highlighting on, because uh, in the basic law, we are guaranteed to have um, the final adjudication power in the uh, courts of final appeal in Hong Kong. But uh, over these years, there has been uh, four interpretation of basic law by the National People's Congress, which uh, only one of them were carried out according to the procedures stipulated in the basic law. The other three were actually like raised by the executive branch, which were definitely not provided by the basic law and any of the provisions inside. And uh, some of them were even uh, challenged that uh, the decision by the National People's Congress is totally uh, contradictory to the law in Hong Kong, but uh, they provide no sufficient reasons when uh, they pose such decision on uh, that interpretation. So I believe um, there are different aspects showing that one country, two system is actually deteriorating in Hong Kong. Uh, now, that the, uh, now that the protests have been ended, uh, what do you think will be the next step for the student movement? Well, actually, uh, the Federation cannot represent like uh, all the students in Hong Kong up to this moment because the students, uh, they are having different uh, organizations uh, newly set up uh, even um, after the movement, the umbrella movement. And uh, for the Federation, uh, we are going to take note of some critical time points, especially uh, the second stage of the political reform consultation, which uh, may be coming in a few months. And also, uh, the passage of uh, the government's proposal in the Legislative Council, uh, perhaps in uh, March or April next year. Uh, I think at these two critical time points, we are going to have other movements. Um, I won't rule out any possibilities. There may be uh, another occupying movement, or uh, there will be movements uh, trying to crush uh, into those occasions if we were not granted the right to enter the venue uh, upon uh, application. Because we do have some opinions to speak up uh, in those uh, consultative forums. But there has been precedent cases in which the government tried to ban Hong Kong citizens from entering those consultative forums. So uh, we won't rule out any possibilities of um, and other actions of movements uh, if that is the case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, can I, can I, um, uh, our purpose of our inquiry is to mainly focus on the um, Foreign and Commonwealth Office UK government response to uh, the situation in Hong Kong. Um, but I'm interested to know how your generation of Hong Kong people perceive the United Kingdom and uh, its relationship with Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, when the Sino 
British uh, Joint Declaration was signed, uh, I wasn't even born. And uh, yeah. when I was born, <laughs> yes, I have, I've got no way to alter the decision uh, laid down by uh, the government of the United Kingdom and the uh, Central People's Government of China. Um, the Hong Kong's, uh, the future of Hong Kong has already been decided. But like up to this moment, uh, what we observe is that uh, one contractual party uh, has a potential breach of the joint declaration. And what we are trying to do is to, um, is to um, avoid that from happening, is to uh, try to make the Chinese government uh, stick to what they have promised 30 years ago. We are asking for nothing new. We are just trying to seek for your assistance in uh, making China fulfill their promise 30 years ago. So I think um, most of the uh, youngsters in Hong Kong, uh, we really wish to see justice um, blessing Hong Kong. Yes, we really want to see China uh, fulfilling their promise, which they have laid down 30 years ago. And we are, we will be satisfied. Yes. Thank you. It is your is the attitude of your generation and those who were perhaps uh, two, three, or four years old in 1997? Uh, is that different to those who were adults at the time of the handover? Uh, well, I I don't think there are like inherent difference. Um, what I've mentioned, like uh, asking the Chinese government to stick to what they have promised, uh, I think this is the view shared by all generations of Hong Kong people. But uh, for the means of how we attain that, maybe there, there are slight differences. Like for example, in the uh, umbrella movement, uh, all generations uh, did participate in the movement. But when it comes to like uh, escalation of actions, uh, like uh, what we what we have uh, said that we might probably do, like uh, crushing into the consultative forums, maybe some of these means uh, may not be agreed by uh, all the generations of Hong Kong people. But for what we are going to achieve, like for the ends of all these actions, I believe uh, actually all generations of Hong Kong people share the same will. So this is a discussion about different approaches to tactics rather than strategy? Um, well, I would say, uh, like for these actions, like asking the uh, Parliament of the United Kingdom to um, assist us in uh, enforcing the Sino-British Joint Declaration to uh, make the principles uh, to be realized in Hong Kong, I believe this is a view uh, actually shared by all generations of Hong Kong people. But in some like ways or means of actions uh, or strategies, yeah, some other strategies, maybe uh, there are disagreements. How, how do you assess um, the response that there has been from the United Kingdom government to the umbrella movement? Well, actually, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but Actually, I see no concrete response from the uh, British government because um, what I've been expecting is that uh, there could be more honourable actions, uh, including uh, an active investigation that comes earlier uh, on whether there are any parties uh, trying to breach the uh, Sino-British Joint Declaration. And also there could have been actions of condemnation if uh, there is actually a breach. Um, so I believe these are uh, actions that could really pressurize uh, the Chinese government uh, in responding to the movement. Like the movement now is not really over, but the occupation area has all been cracked down by the Hong Kong police. And uh, it ha has already been two months um, since the start of the movement since the use of tear gas uh, by our government uh, to those peaceful protesters. And over these two months, actually, what I felt was really despair, um, like being really lonely in, in trying to bring a change. So I wish all these assistance could have come earlier. Yes. Thank you. Thank John Barrow. 
Can I uh, and and welcome uh, is on. Can I can I um press you on the joint declaration? You wanted to say uh, make a number of comments right at the beginning. Um, yes. We've now moved on to our the phase of the questioning where we're focusing on the joint declaration. Um, can I give you the opportunity of, of, of saying what you wanted to say right at the beginning with regard to the points you wanted to make? Okay. Uh, well, actually, um, I think the joint declaration has promised Hong Kong people with uh, democracy and uh, the how it will be uh, implemented practically uh, is further stated in the basic law. But the basic law in its preamble uh, has stated very clearly that uh, it is to uh, realize the basic policies of the Central People's Government over Hong Kong. Uh, so actually, the joint declaration uh, could be observed if the basic law is duly observed. So uh, we can go into the articles in the joint declaration. For example, in Article 3, uh, it is said that the chief executive of Hong Kong uh, shall be elected, uh, shall be selected by election or through consultations held locally and be appointed by the Central People's uh, Government. So the intention in the joint declaration uh, must be having an election in compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR. And the ICCPR in its Article 25 has also stated that every citizen shall have the rights and opportunity without reasonable restrictions to vote and be elected at genuine periodic elections, which shall be universal and equal suffrage. And uh, in the comments, uh, general comments number 25, uh, adopted by the U United Nations Human Rights Committee, it has also uh, stated that, uh, that any states or regions uh, adopting the means of election uh, in choosing uh, the representative uh, should have also stated their measures uh, to guarantee genuine free and periodic decisions, uh, elections. So uh, we can see that up to this moment, uh, the universal suffrage, which has been promised in the basic law, should also be in compliance with the ICCPR Article 25. They argue that uh, there has been reservation made by both the uh, British government uh, during, uh, before 1997 and also uh, the Chinese government after 1997 uh, on the case of Hong Kong, which means Article 25 should not be applied in the case of Hong Kong. But uh, actually, in the general comments, it has also been mentioned that uh, once a state uh, used the means of election to select their representative of the people, uh, Article 25 must uh, apply to the case. And that has been reaffirmed by the uh, UN uh, Human Rights Committee uh, in a case study in Hong Kong in 2006, uh, saying that uh, actually Article 25 will apply in Hong Kong once we have universal suffrage. But uh, the decision made by the NPCSC uh, in late August stated that uh, there will be a uh, small circle nomination committee covering only less than 7% of the Hong Kong's electorate. Uh, and there will be a 50% threshold uh, in the nomination committee, which means a candidate must attain nomination from at least 6,000 people sorry, 600 people uh, to become a candidate in the CE election. So uh, basically, these two uh, are the hurdles acting, uh, which refrain Hong Kong people from having free expression of, of the will of the electors. So this is a direct um, breach on the ICCPR Article 25. So we can see that uh, the intention of the uh, Sino-British Joint Declaration was actually allowing Hong Kong to have uh, a free election uh, in compliance with the ICCPR. But it turns out that uh, the Beijing government uh, has been imposing a design of electoral system, uh, which public opinion or uh, re unreasonable restrictions will be used as a ground to deprive uh, somebody from uh, acting the right to stand for election. So this is a uh, direct breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration in uh, most of the Hong Kong people's view. And actually, uh, what worries us um, is the recent saying by um, a Beijing official, the vice chairman of the MPC Standing Committee's Basic Law Committee, uh, Zhang Rongshun. 
he actually stated that Hong Kong people should be re-enlightened about the understanding towards basic law. And uh, if we read this together with the uh, stipulations in the white paper issued by the State Council in June this year, which says still some people in Hong Kong are even confused uh, in their understanding of one country, two systems and the basic law, uh, we could deduce that there is an intention for the Central People's Government uh, in the PRC to rewrite its own promise by ignoring the virtue of basic law, which was stated in the preamble. Uh, as what I have mentioned, the basic policies of PRC regarding Hong Kong have been elaborated uh, in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. And the basic law to be practiced in Hong Kong SAR should be ensuring the implementation of the basic policies of the People's Republic of China regarding Hong Kong. So the point is that once the basic law is not duly fulfilled or is not duly uh, practiced in Hong Kong, we could see uh, there is also a potential breach of the Beijing government and the Hong Kong national government towards the Sino-British Joint Declaration. And it is clear that when they are not imposing a genuine universal suffrage, a genuine free election, uh, we can see that there is a potential breach on both the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the basic law. So okay, that is the Yvonne, problem we're confronting. Okay, Yvonne, can I just be absolutely clear though? We are running short of time, so I'm gonna to have to keep this short, but can I just be absolutely clear? It is your view, is it? You, you use the word potential there, but it is your view that there has actually been a breach of the joint declaration, um, yes. and, I, and I take that as a yes for the reasons you, yes. you've given. Can I briefly then just bring you back to the point um, raised by a colleague earlier? There's, there's been a breach. You've been disappointed about the response by the UK government to that breach because there's obligations yes. on both sides of this this joint declaration. Do you yes. think it would do what? What effect would a more robust um, approach by the FCO and the UK government have, do you think, on the Chinese authorities? Well, I believe um, international pressure up to this moment uh, is still effective in uh, bringing the uh, Chinese government to uh, duly observe what had been stated in uh, an unif an, uh, international treaty, which means the Joint Declaration. And I think uh, actually the identity of the government of the United Kingdom uh, is a bit special, uh, other from uh, other than the other um, governments uh, around the globe, because. Uh, actually, the government of the United Kingdom is one of the contractual parties of the Joint Declaration, and it is an international treaty. So, uh, actually, when uh, we are talking about a contract, if a party is breaching the terms in it, uh, I think the another contractual party definitely have the right uh, to bring them to uh, some penalty or condemnation. I think. Uh, the parliament of the United Kingdom uh, should um, take that honourable action to, like, voice out um, for the Hong Kong people. Okay. Can I can I thank you for your bravery uh, in in your protests and, and being with us today as well? Thank you. Thank you. The, the six month report that the FCO produced, you will be aware of. And they have never identified a breach of the joint declaration, and they continue to say that the one country, two systems work well. Obviously, you don't agree with that. Um, what do you think the UK response should be if, if there is a breach and or if the joint declaration is under threat? Sorry, I, could, I couldn't hear the question clearly. But, you, the, the six monthly reports, are you aware of the six monthly reports that the UK produces the FCO about Hong Kong? Yeah. And they have never identified a breach of the joint declaration and they continue to say in the, in the latest report that uh, the one country, two systems continues to work well. From what you say, I assume you don't agree with that analysis, but if the joint declaration is under threat, what do you think the UK should do about that? Okay, uh, well, I think, uh, firstly, there should be a condemnation, definitely. Uh, if uh, 
there is still like no improvement uh, by the Chinese government. I believe uh, because this is an international treaty, so uh, I would um, request the uh, government of the United Kingdom to uh, seek for uh, some legal measures um, in asking the Chinese government uh, to uh, duly observe an international treaty. Okay. That's a good question. <clears throat> Yvonne, thank you very much indeed. That, that's been really helpful. Um, we finished our line of questioning. Is there anything else you'd like to say in conclusion? Um, really thank you for your time and um, I hope uh, justice could really come to Hong Kong. Thank and I also endorse what my colleague John Barron has said. It it's, it's very, shows a lot of courage to come and uh, speak publicly ab about this. Mm -hmm. And we wish you well, and please keep in touch with us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye.